1973 would prove to be one of the most challenging years in automotive history as the OPEC oil embargo would hit and individuals would be stuck at gas stations for long periods of time just trying to get a few gallons to put in their tank. It was in the shadow of this OPEC oil embargo that individuals started thinking about buying vehicles other than the typical full-size vehicles that many people were used to and started trading down to, or at least looking more intently, at intermediately sized cars. However, when General Motors was planning the 1973 intermediate lineup, they had no idea, obviously, that the oil embargo was going to hit. But nonetheless, GM, and in particular the Buick division, really wanted to hit a home run with the new intermediates that it was going to introduce for 1973. The full-size vehicles had been redone for the 1971 model year across all of the General Motors divisions, and in 1973 they would be all new across all the divisions as well, whether you selected the Chevrolet Malibu, the Pontiac Le Mans, or the Grand Am, the Buick, in this case the Century, which came in a number of different trims, the Century, the Century Luxus, and the Century Regal, or the Oldsmobile Cutlass, they all were new. One other element that wasn't foreseen at the start of the intermediate vehicles planning was the bumper standards that would be enacted for 1973, at least in the front, the 5-mile-an-hour impact standard. And then in 1974, there would be a 5-mile-an-hour impact standard in the rear. So designers, when they were thinking up these vehicles, weren't thinking that they were going to have enormous bumper offsets to begin with. Of course, those would later become a key feature not only of these intermediate vehicles, but frankly, every vehicle that was sold in the United States during this time frame. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the 1973 Buick Century Regal, the top-of-the-line intermediate for Buick, and the Regal nameplate was introduced in 1973 and obviously carried on for many years for Buick. Let's start out with a few sketches, as we like to do on this program. Here's one for the new Buick Intermediate Coupe, and a couple things are interesting about this. The first is that backlight and how it's got like a plan view V shape to it and almost a hot wire bend in the middle, similar to the 67 to 70 Eldorado backlight. Kind of a cool feature that really didn't make it through to production, at least in this dramatic form as you're seeing here. The second element to note is that opera window. And the opera window was becoming an increasingly popular feature on General Motors cars during this time period because of impending rollover standards, which GM didn't think that they could meet with the typical hardtop style glass, particularly on the four doors. And so the four doors on these cars have that pillar in the middle of them, and the coupes also have a distinctive pillar with the opera window as opposed to having the typical hardtop glass with the droppable rear window. That doesn't exist on here. One thing that is interesting to me in this sketch is that that opera window is perfectly vertical, whereas the production model would have kind of a, I guess you'd call it a trapezoidal shape to it. And this shape of the opera window that's denoted in the sketch really reminds me of the opera window on the 71 Eldorado. Now, that opera window in the 71 Eldorado, if you've been listening to the program, was added late to the game and was done purposefully to set up the impending release of the 1973 Monte Carlo, which would debut that opera window on the intermediate size cars. Of course, all the intermediate coupes had this opera window and the thought there was that the styling would be introduced on the 71 Eldorado so that when these intermediates would be introduced a few years later, people would think, oh, I've got a baby Eldorado in effect. That's one of the things that you always try to do in a great design tenant is introduce new styling features and themes on upper end cars and then have them trickle down to the lower end models. It's not a good idea to go the other way around. And unfortunately, that happens, well, relatively often, whether that's the Chevrolet Volt and then the subsequent ELR coming out after it, or even the 83 Thunderbird and Cougar and the 84 Mark VII coming out after that. You just don't want to trickle up. You want to trickle down when it comes to styling themes. Next, take a look at the wheel flares there, this kind of squircle style wheel flare. And that would kind of make it through to production a little bit less dramatic than what you see here. But Overall, it's pretty close to what ended up in production. Now, one area of significant divergence is really the front fender area 
and how the fender interfaces with the door. On the production car, that fender would set up this beautiful diving line that would continue all the way through the rear portion of the front door. And you just don't see that here. It does set up a surface on the door, but it doesn't kind of move downward as you go back on the car. You also see that this particular vehicle has a pretty distinctive midsection that is rather fat and then significant amount of tumble home and the body kind of tucks under below that as well. And that was a bit of a feature of the production car, but certainly not as exaggerated as it is here. And here's a full-size model out on GM's design patio. I believe this is one of the early models, perhaps before the program got delayed by 12 to 18 months. And you notice here that the front bumper is almost non-existent. I'm not quite sure if it's missing or that front end isn't necessarily finished yet. But take a look at the body side and you can see that diving line that I was talking about is now starting to appear on the door. Although there's really two lines on that door. There is a feature line that kind of starts at the door and then runs rearward. And then there's also that diving line starting from the front fender. And to me, at least, the front fender area looks a little bit 63 to 65 Riviera-esque, of course, without the hidden headlamps inside there. Also notice the shape of the rear quarter glass and the B pillar as well as the C pillar here. This was evidently before it was determined that there would be an opera window placed back there. And here you can also see that the wheelhouses have that squircle shape, but the flares aren't very prominent at all. In fact, they're almost non-existent compared to the drawing that you just saw. Let's take a look at a full-size rendering now that I suspect was done after this particular model that you just saw. Now, this is coming closer to the final production version, although you will note that the bumpers are relatively small, probably before they were aware of the bumper standards being implemented. But that kind of back portion of the car is starting to look, well, pretty close to what it would look like on the final vehicle. That opera window with the slant and then the C pillar as well as the B pillar area, that's getting pretty close, as well as the front glass, I would say, too. You do notice that diving feature line there that starts at the leading edge of the fender and then continues back to the rear of that front door. Overall, I think a handsome proposal, but well, aside from the chunky front bumper, I think the 73 Regal in the production version was actually the most handsome of all and was an especially good-looking vehicle. Let's talk now more about the production car. And here you have the production 73 Regal. Now, as I mentioned, the Regal nameplate was introduced in 1973, and it was really the Century Regal. The Century nameplate was brought back for 1973, and you had the base Century, the Century Luxus, and the Regal. And you had them in two- and four-door form. And then there was also a wagon. So there were a number of body styles, but this was all new for the 1973 model year. And while these cars look relatively big by today's standards, they kind of were small. They certainly were intermediates. The wheelbase of the coupes was actually different from the sedans. The coupes rode atop 112-inch wheelbase. And the sedans rode atop a 116-inch wheelbase. So you got a little bit more legroom in the sedans versus the coupes. Now, the wagons also rode atop a 116-inch wheelbase shared with the sedans. The overall length of these vehicles was around, on the coupes, 210-ish inches. The Regal was a bit longer than the other models. And the sedans were about 212 inches. The wagons, 216 and a half inches-ish overall. So relatively, well, we won't call them nimble, but about 10 plus inches shorter than a full-size vehicle. So more manageable for sure. Let's take a look at the rear three-quarter view of this vehicle. This is actually, I think, my favorite view of the car. And this particular vehicle, finished in this blue metallic, I think shows off the highlights especially well. Take a look at that highlight there on the top portion of the rear quarter panel, as well as how the light is breaking on the surfacing on the door. It's just beautiful. And I like the taillight treatment on these two, this kind of scalloped out lights in the rear. Now, in addition to having the cool styling, the Buick Regal and the other models in the Century lineup had some interesting running gear underneath. They had Buick's AccuDrive suspension geometry that was supposed to help with overall stability. And I will say that these cars 
actually ride and handle shockingly well. Maybe one of the best balances between ride and handling of any vehicle during this era from a domestic auto company. They ride very comfortably, not an overly stiff ride, and they also handle well. Whether it's the Buick or the Olds or the Pontiac, they all have that great feel, and they're quite quiet inside too. Speaking of the inside, let's take a look here at the inside of this Regal, and I think this is the most tasteful of the A-bodies, and it really should be because it's the most expensive. Of course, the wood grain here is fake, as was typical for the time frame, but overall, a pretty handsome instrument cluster. This does have the driver-centric kind of wraparound cluster, which was also true for some of the other A-bodies, like the Oles. And the Pontiac also had a little bit of that theme going on too, but the dash was designed so that a lot of the instrument bulbs could be serviced from the front of the dash. You didn't have to take a top pad off and kind of separate everything. And that was true not just of the Buick, but also of the Oles dashboard. And the seats here are also kind of an interesting pattern, a ribbed pattern that does, I think, look rich overall. And here's a better look at the interior and the seats. Kind of an interesting stitch pattern with these ribs as well as the different, I guess you'd call them pillows, if you will, the three on the backrest there. But an overall tasteful and handsome design and a great place to sit. These seats are quite comfortable in these vehicles. I don't know who GM had doing their seat engineering during this time period, but they were able to work miracles with the comfort of their bench seats. The bench seats that I've sat in in the 73 Regals, as well as the bench seat in my 73 Cutlass, are some of the most comfortable seats that I've ever sat in in any car, frankly. So they had really good engineers, and they designed really good seats, much more comfortable than Ford and Chrysler and AMC bench seats of the era, which never really were overly comfortable at least in my mind. And under hood in your Regal, you could get four different engine choices. The standard engine was a 350 cubic inch two-barrel V8 that made 150 horsepower. One up from that was the same 350 with a four-barrel carburetor that made 175 horsepower. Then you could really start stepping up to more power, the 455 cubic inch four-barrel V8 making 225 horsepower. And then the top engine was the Stage 1, which was still around in 1973 and made 270 horsepower. I don't know how many people, if any, ordered that in the Regal. I do know that there were a number of stage ones that were ordered in the Century Grand Sport as an example, but not quite sure if anybody had one in a Regal, but you could order it. Now, the other interesting thing here is take a look in this engine compartment and you'll notice something that was newly introduced for the 1973 model year under hood. See that radiator shroud, this kind of white plastic radiator shroud to which the coolant bottle as well as I believe the washer fluid reservoir are secured? Well, that was new for the 1973 model year and was a Buick exclusive. I have no idea why Buick felt the need to have a unique radiator shroud where you could have the coolant bottle as well as the washer fluid reservoir secured to it. But they were the only GM division that had it, and it was introduced for 1973. And it, I don't know that it looks all that great. You can also see that this vehicle has an air pump there on the driver's side of the accessory drives. This was obviously getting to the point where emissions were becoming an increasingly challenging element for automakers to meet. And as a consequence, this Buick V8 needed an air pump even for federal cars. And that effectively just injected fresh air into the exhaust manifold, helping it burn cleaner and have less tailpipe emissions. Of course, the catalytic converter would come along a few years later in 1975, and that would further help with emissions, but also choke down the horsepower even more. In any case, the Regal would go on to be a quite successful model uh, in the Buick lineup for 1973. And the Century itself was also quite successful. In 1973, Buick sold almost 300,000 Centuries in total, and the Regal comprised 91,557 of those. You could only get the Regal as a two-door coupe. Most all the models sold quite well, except the wagons, which kind of were dogs in the showroom. The base Century wagon, whether it was six or nine passengers, the production figures for those combined was just 7,700 units, 
And the Century Luxus wagon, one up from that, and the most deluxe intermediate Buick wagon you could get because there was no Regal wagon, sold 10,645 units. So a pretty weak showing overall for the wagons. But really, the 1973 Buick Century Regal was an excellent looking vehicle and really the start of something special for Buick. And heck, even Kojak was driving around, not in a Regal, but in a Century, a 1974 Century with a 455 after all. In any event, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, take care.